Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. The Dutch photonics ecosystem known as Photon Delta is many things, including its own value chain, a 60-plus member industry consortium, a strategic partner, and increasingly, a supply chain builder. But fundamentally, Photon Delta can be thought of as the bedrock of the Netherlands' burgeoning photonics industry. At its center are photonics integrated circuits, and at its top is today's guest, CEO Ewitt Roos, who joins us momentarily. Since its founding in 2016, Photon Delta has sought to cultivate a scalable model to promote and protect integrated photonics technology. With principal considerations given to the supply chain, multiple technology areas, a bridge from academia to industry, and decades worth of Dutch-led photonics innovation, the ecosystem has so far proved a massive success. To date, Photon Delta has formed over 65 partnerships and handled nearly $330 million in aggregated investment. By 2030, Photon Delta aims to create a production capacity of 100,000 plus wafers per year. Critical to that ambition is $1.2 billion in public and private investment that Photon Delta secured in April 2022. Today, Photon Delta bills itself as a cross-border ecosystem of photonic chip technology organizations. According to Hewitt Roos, whose voice is the next that you'll hear, that alone made Photon Delta's trip to San Francisco in Photonics West 2023 one of strategic importance. No longer, Roos says, is the global photonics community simply looking at Photon Delta with interest. Interest, including from those here in the United States, has pivoted towards collaboration. Within this dynamic, Roos's focus is on the global supply chain. The US is is strategic for Photon Delta for a couple of reasons. Well, our strength as Photon Delta is that, that we that we invent, we develop and 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 and, and supply pick or pick enabled to semi-finished uh, devices, including packaging actually, for, for several industries that, that require photonic functionalities. And I d- deliberately define it that broad. So so in, in that perspective, we are part of a supply chain, more or less dedicated towards a particular product group. And these supply chains are very much typical semiconductor supply chains where electronic chips and devices are supposed to be enriched with photonic functionalities. It is in, in these supply chains, which are often global, Photon Delta wants to have a position with the best photonic solutions, the best building blocks, the best performance, etc. Example, for LiDAR, we can develop uh, and produce PIC-based imaging engines, as 3D, uh, 3D imaging engines, a sensor for autonomous or, or semi-autonomous driving. But the same technology can be used for machine vision and devices and uh, allowing you to identify depth of a scratch on the surface of a mirror. But it's a different supply chain you have to be in. So presence and visibility to get to know the needs and to share our capabilities are essential. And therefore, we were on Photonics West. And our experience and my experience, it's not the first time that we are there. We did not have to explain anymore what Photon Delta was all about. So many companies want, want to work with partners in our ecosystem. And and furthermore, that, that's also something I noticed. I saw a sense of urgency and many initiatives in, in, in San Francisco to apply PICs and driven by demand. So my takeaway was there, this industry is evolving much less from a technology push, but much more there is a technology pool. The question is not what are you making, when can you deliver? And especially the communication and, 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 and 3D imaging. That's my takeaway. I have a couple of uh, positioning questions. And again, this is sort of based on the way that the Photonics West, at least the exhibition was laid out. You could go from the Dutch pavilion to the Hong Kong pavilion yeah. to um, to the English pavilion, the France pavilion, uh, Canada and Quebec even itself. had You know, it, it was geographically set up and that, that makes sense. From a Photon Delta perspective, can you position the, the ecosystem on a global scale? Because you mentioned that it's, you know, the U.S. and North America is an important, I guess, piece of the puzzle for Photon Delta. Definitely. Put it into context for us. As an ecosystem, as photonic integration, as a photonic integration ecosystem as such, you, you're nothing, to put it very black and white. Because no one gets excited about just another pick. You have to be able to interact, to position control points in the supply chains 
that are using or supposed to use these PIC functionalities, those photonic functionalities. Therefore, it's an ecosystem, yeah, but an ecosystem embedded in a global in a global ecosystem. Let me share with you some 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 ingredients of our model because I think that's the background of your of, of your question. Now, where do you differentiate? You need really as an ecosystem, which I just just told you, an ambition, a vision. What's your strategy to get there? And together with whom? So, and these are key. And I'll give you some ingredients of our model. We have a very intense interaction. That's also the, the continuous, let's say, activity within our ecosystem between science, policy, industry and society to an extent. So find common ground for an ambition that we have in the Netherlands to build an industry around integrated photonics technology. And we have the fortunate position to, to have a heritage. We're standing on shoulders of giants like ASML and Philips and whatever. That's one thing. But another key element is that we also focus on what we are good at and what we miss, there we look for cooperation. So my philosophy is cooperate with what you lack, with those who can fill the gaps in your ecosystem, in your expertise, in your supply chain or, or whatever, or where others are much better in. And that's that's good ground for, co- for, for cooperation. So cooperation and trust. And what is critical for the government? What are they going to, what can they do to support that on a state, province or region level? What do we expect from industry, SME, some leading players? How to exploit research results? And, and ensure that innovation in this ecosystem is continuously fueled because it's not a it's not a one night stand, especially not in this industry. You have to, to have a continuous engine for innovation and do things better because it's also an industry where the winner takes it all. Whether it's a small, when it's a niche or it's a big or it's a big game, you have to excel in terms of performance, in terms of innovation, in terms of delivery. Uh, that makes it also a very dynamic ecosystem. Well, that's almost a condition. You have to cr- you have to critically adapt to the realities in the world, and and in the latter case, of course, the the, the fast changing geopolitical circumstances. Uh, we might come back to that. We might come back on that. Then the second part is, which is essential, it's commitment and leverage. Yeah, in Europe we are used to to subsidies and uh, and, and and government support to to a large extent. But this ecosystem relies also heavily and pushes heavily private funding. So if, if I put a dime, one dollar or one euro as a as a subsidy, I expect at least three or four private dollars on top of that. And and that's and that's great. We call it the carrot and the stick. As Photon Delta, we are in a fortunate position that we have sufficient funds. It's not spread and spray. You can benefit from those from that, that subsidy. If you want to contribute and if you want then you don't so you have also a kind of steering mechanism for the development of this of this very industry here in the netherlands and obviously it's for the longer term so so industry development within an ecosystem is not about a couple of years it's 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 a 10-year plus thing so with respect to the government we need to have also a sustainable industry policy therefore we were very close with our governments then the third thing among four it's a very result-driven entrepreneurial approach. What you often see with ecosystem management is that, and with all respect for these people, don't get me wrong, these are former people from the administration, from public administration who are running these ecosystems. I have only people from business. They have to have, they worked for corporates, they had their own business because they know what it is to book results. They think in terms of results. They think in terms, they think in terms of output. We have to deliver. That's the culture. Uh, and that's how we manage, we try to manage and support this ecosystem. So preferably investing instead of giving a subsidy, avoiding creating, creating all kinds of subsidy zombies, right, which you have in many ecosystems. So customers first, second and third. And subsidize only what the market yet is unable to support like R&D or too early stage uh, or to an extent some capex for foundry because this business is also uh, a capex intensive business and the fourth thing that's the last thing is leadership and focus you must have uh, and you must find a clear and convincing claim to win and be very clear about your goals and your agenda so it is also clear where others can contribute and can take their position 
And that is a very good and fertile ground, I would say, for cooperation. So not always do it yourself. And as your results, good, disappointing failures, and continuously involve your stakeholders to learn. And, and I call that leadership. Leadership is also about telling the things that you cannot do. It's where you need help from others. But leadership is also, if you claim to win somewhere, just go for it. And with this, I think those four elements, you create trust and confidence, and that's pretty essential. A common hurdle affecting most high-tech, high-importance technology areas involves the ability to effectively convey importance. Getting a message of urgency through to governmental representatives and prospective partners is hardly unique to integrated photonics. In the U.S., the quantum realm is facing this obstacle. In the Netherlands, Roos says that finally, Photon Delta has cleared the hurdle. Societal buy-in is a separate target. You know, it occurs to me, and I'm going to use an example, and it's not a perfect, you know, it's sort of an apples to oranges. It's not a perfect analogy. In the U.S., there's a lot of talk in terms of um, dealing with, with governmental representatives. I'm going to use the quantum analogy. There's a lot of explaining from people in the quantum space that has to be done to government to get them on their side because no one really, you know, it, quantum isn't something that is familiar to everyone. And quantum integrated photonics are different. And you just mentioned that um, a lot of the people in your corner are from business. And quantum, it's, it's still a lot of R&D and there isn't as much on the commercial side. How much explaining has to go into your conversations with government on semiconductor and PIC technologies? Good point. We're getting over that. It, it's not a question anymore. And that's what I meant when I said in investing and supporting this, this very technology on a national level is not a one-night stand. It's, it's all, it should be industry policy. And in the Netherlands, it became industry policy. So the explanation about what it could do is fortunately not that important anymore. We have done it over the last eight years. And you see that on different levels. Eh? We just got this uh, 1.1 billion uh, uh, investment, which is also to a large extent privately funded. But look also at the EU CHIPS Act. Photonic integration is in there. Photonics is considered to be a key enabling technology for many, many applications, for many, more, for many also societal challenges. Uh, to deal with. And, and, and the easy one is, is the energy and speed and connectivity, etc. you name it. So we are beyond the point to explain why it is important. We, we have accomplished that because we have the trust from all those, from all those people, uh, because it's people. And, and we, we put a lot of effort in ensuring that they understand. Now, that's the government part. The society, the, the general public, is, is definitely, uh, let's say, a, a, a target group uh, to educate a bit more on this. And not because... They are very interested in the scientific part. Also, uh, electronics is, is still to be taught uh, to the general public. But it's also to get people interested to join this, to, to get into this technology and to work in this, in this industry. So for, from that angle, it's important to do so. Within Photon Delta's network of partners and collaborators are nearly 60 companies that give the ecosystem a robust presence in industry. With PICS at the center of the working web, these companies market offerings in quantum tech, data and telecom, lasers, biophotonics, test and measurement, and a host of other technologies. Photon Delta is all about connectivity and working towards a common objective to grow and protect integrated photonics. Photon Delta is unique in that it encompasses so many different technologies, all converging around that common objective. Part of growing, not just cultivating an ecosystem, but, but growing it once it's sort of on the ground or in the ground, uh, is working in different technology areas. You mentioned different applications, different technology areas. For, for the yeah. sake of this question, we'll, we'll consider them the same. And Photon Delta certainly does this. I'm just taking into account micro line in the test yeah. and assembly area. I mentioned Quix Quantum, that's quantum tech. Sheila, certainly there, there's activity in the laser space. Effect, uh, talent and data comm, a nice uh, funding round there for effect. Um, so much of this model revolves around PICS, though, integrated photonics. How do the member companies working on their own distinct technology areas come together to support this common technology area, uh, photonic integrated circuits? The whole strategy behind Photon Delta is to have a supply chain. So Photon Delta started and is still focused on we must have a supply chain. Let's say starting with R&D, yeah, the very first, and, and innovation centers, academia, industry cooperation, 
uh, having uh, design services, having having manufacturing, foundries, packaging, integration, you name it. So Photon Delta is about a supply chain for the big industry with centers of gravity in indium phosphide and silicon nitride based uh, uh, manufacturing and packaging. So. Uh, of course, we have we have dedicated uh, R&D centers like like the Photonic Integration Technology Center, Holst, and iMac. Not not to forget iMac, supporting innovation with with all these projects driven by end users for applications and supply chain partners for for process optimization and scaling and integration whatsoever. And because of the supply chain and its partners, we basically provide a system for enhancing this enabling function of this technology. In many applications, so we welcome a broad range of technologies supporting and strengthening that supply chain, and therefore our mission. Yeah, and and because we are doing this, it becomes clear where we lack ap- uh, expertise and and solutions and technologies, and, and giving a very good reason to see cooperation to complement or even join the, our, our ecosystem. And that's what we see. We have people, we have now companies interested in making reactors for three five systems, but we work together very close with IMAC. And with XFAP in France, because we lack CMOS and, and silicon photonics expertise. And around this, we built a whole ecosystem and we serve our startups. We serve our fabulous companies who want to make the most interesting uh, uh, features using our ecosystem and using our connections in the ecosystem. It's not about, it's not just about borders. It's about creating such a system or an environment, whatever you want to call it, with all these kinds of functionalities to attract innovative companies or existing companies who want to use this technology and we can serve them. And then on top of that, what you'll see as well is that you attract venture capital and all kinds of service providers who want to join the ecosystem. And that's, and that's how we grew. We grew from four companies. So we now in, we are in the 60 and it's growing. I, I dare to say it's growing every week. This notion of, of R&D and research centers that are not university affiliated, it really works itself into conversations um, on many, many topics in, in optics and photonics. Um, and I try not to understate it because in the U.S., which is you know what we're most familiar with, obviously, we have a national lab model. We have think tanks. It's hardly the same thing. Just in terms of the spin-out companies from an IMEC or a LETI alone, uh, much less the work that's going on in the institutions themselves currently, it's profound. Can you just uh, – you've done this so much already, but just speak to the value of having a, a, a non-affiliated R&D center that is committed to the same work that you're doing. I give you, I give you an example that explains it all. We, we got this uh, 1.1 uh, billion, uh, which, is, which, is, which is a lot of money. And it's so easy to say, hey, we built a, a, a prototyping factory and everyone can come. We don't. We use that money to a large extent to have R&D-like projects based on product roadmaps with industry, with NXP, with the Thermo Fishers of this world, with Dexerials, with Hamamatsu, with US companies, driving innovation, driving, let's say, the next-gen products they want to have and what they need based on their roadmaps. And we are able to fund that for 50%. And you broaden such an R&D roadmap or an R&D project with other companies in the vicinity of that. That other 50%, or 30 or 40%, whatever it is, is provided by those R&D centers. They don't invent, innovate by themselves. It's industry-driven. There's a carrot and a stick. And the carrot is, hey, because we want to build this industry, but we need your push and the right direction for these developments. I just mentioned uh, uh, LIDAR, for example. We are able to help you in your R&D roadmap and to fund part of that. The other side of the coin is, of course, that we're supposed to be so good because we use, uh, let's say, the infrastructure, the manufacturing infrastructure, the PDKs, that, of course, the perspective is that at least some of them will start to produce here or get their picks from here or use our, our libraries. It's a fragile balance, but... The, the funny thing is, and the good thing is, that's that's how we try to to work. That's how we try to work, at least, is that we say, okay, we do that and we fund, we partly fund, but you have to give direction to the kind of innovation that is required. But at the end of the day, they make the market and they give the order for manufacturing in the back end, or the, well, you 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 name it. So um, and so far, that works pretty good. 
We've spoken uh, or at least touched on um, funding both to Photon Delta itself uh, in the value of excess of $1 billion, um, but also the member companies. I want to talk about investment, bring investment into the conversation yeah. now, too. Uh, and Photon Delta is closing in on uh, $330 million in aggregated, aggregated rather, yeah. investment. And this is very important, obviously, to leverage growth. Uh, I'll take, for example, the investment announced earlier this year in um, Linux International. Um, and that came from an industry academia consortium that included Photon Delta. How has Photon Delta, um, the ecosystem, set up its investment funding system to both support the growth of its companies and members, um, but also itself be supported on a on a fundamental level? First question. Photon Delta has funding, provides funding by means of, let's say, subsidies. Uh, that's basically for R&D and innovation projects, loans, CLAs, and, and even equity. For the first three years, Photon Delta as an organization, I come back to the first one, uh, we were funded uh, for the first three years uh, as an organization, we were funded by a subsidy. And after that period, we had to rely on the returns from our loans. Take that in the back of your mind. So uh, we never fund alone. That's the first thing. We always require co-funding by private parties, always. And that could be venture capital, that could be company means, other lenders, whatever. But there is a requirement. So no, never funding alone. And not because we don't want, but we just want to be sure that private parties will see the value of leveraging on our money. It's also that it shows they have a trust in the company, this particular, uh, in in this particular business. So what we have seen over the last four years is that after funding roughly 50 million in companies, we were able to leverage that 280 million from the market, which is great. But it was from scratch a key message to the companies or ecosystem. There is no free money. So no subsidy, but only loans, CLAs, and equity. Results and co-funding. And this works out, works out pretty well. And again, what I said, uh, exceptions are made for early stage, uh, pre capital R&D, et cetera. But co-funding at least for 50% applies. And it's also in our way of working. I always say to my colleagues, for every hour that we put in, in whatsoever, we need to leverage three to four hours from the market. And that's in the DNA of, of Photon Delta. And, and again, that, that, that works pretty well. And if, if I look now to our income that we create because of loans, we can, uh, we can manage our organization from that. And now with the new growth fund, we have new sources, of course. And the prerequisite, of course, is that you have a very lean and mean organization. You have to be very efficient. Because that's a, that's a condition sine qua non. But therefore, you need to every hour you need to mobilize three or four hours somewhere else. Otherwise, you can never make it as an ecosystem. One of the the the, the core takeaway messages from last year's PIX Summit Europe, you were there, um, was that the the continent of Europe aims to promote and also protect two different yeah. words, two different meanings: promote and protect an integrated photonics ecosystem as it continues to foster growth. Can you? distinguish between those two because they're very different words but they are obviously intertwined yeah well that's a, that's a, that's an important point uh, protection has a couple of dimensions here uh, in eu perspective that's a lot there's a law photonics is a very sensitive technology so i'm talking for tech, uh, for photonics now it's a it's, it's determined as a very sensitive technology and therefore and it's a formal thing foreign investments are subject to review by member state governments Bottom line, it means uh, that they have a say in whether or not a particular investor is is allowed to invest in such a company. That's there. That's like that's a European and therefore member state way to protect companies against hostile takeovers in this uh, sensitive uh, in this sensitive space. And, and you can imagine from the geo- current geopolitical climate what kind of actors are at stake here. Protection also relates to securing supply of integrated photonics and all kinds of semiconductor technologies for European industries, in, for example, automotive or communication, HPC, and even quantum. Since the Dutch, is, the Dutch ecosystem is specialized uh, is in, in, in the indium phosphide, of indium phosphide, silicon nitride, and integration packaging in the European supply chain, we're going to be part, well, that's what we're aiming for, for European funding based on the EU CHIPS Act. Uh, and that has to do, again, with the kind of protection that Europe is arranging for itself to have at least a security of supply within their uh, within their borders, a strategic security of supply. I mean, not that they want to do it all themselves because that would be a bit insane, but uh, to have at least some key technologies available 
again, security of supply for the respective uh, industries. Automotive is one of them, but high performance computing as well. So two elements, it's a formal, it's a formal thing. Uh, and secondly, it's security of supply. A global consideration that will rear its head again later in our interview is that which has come to envelop Dutch semiconductor supplier ASML. Like Photon Delta, ASML was born in the city of Eindhoven. And, like Photon Delta, the company's footprint can be seen across the semiconductor and microelectronics space. ASML's prized technology is its extreme ultraviolet, or EUV, lithography machines. At present, ASML is the only company in the world capable of producing this technology, vital to the production of cutting-edge chip technology. The company has endured recent hiccups, notably the allegation of a misappropriation of data related to its proprietary technology, tied to a former employee based in China. All the while, the company has found itself square in the middle of charged export control discussions between leading global powers. More on this topic later. First, we asked Roos about the importance of high-volume production to the functionality of the Photon Delta ecosystem. Though EUV machines don't exactly qualify here, the concept of high volume isn't rightfully mentioned without noting what it is that an EUV machine yields. Product, and not technology, are king in this area. I, I look at these markets from another angle. Integrated photonics is, is, is enabling eh, for many of many applications and, and, and also for those we do not yet know about, like the semicon 30 years ago. However, you, you need to, to, to mature your ecosystem, to mature your industry, you need pipe cleaners. So high volume products getting through the line in the supply chain to ensure uh, basically very efficient, high yield, reliable production in front and back end. That's what you need, pipe cleaners. So, and that's how I look at those at those markets. The data com requires volumes with, with a relatively high turnaround. Every three years, you need something new. And because of creating this efficiency in the supply chain, costs are going down and new markets will be reached to use this technology. Fascinating, eh? spectroscopy eh? to determine a bacteria, disease or virus or multiple ones. And as a result of reflection of light, that's great. Uh, and the intelligence to process data that all on a, on a single chip. Yeah, that's blowing my mind, but I don't care. Uh, or that's in uh, agriculture or, or medical or healthcare. Just I, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm looking at it from a business point of view. Yep. We need to have pipe cleaners, and then it will grow further. And so, yeah, uh, that, that answers your question. Yeah, it's great perspective, and I, you know, it, it sort of guides me to this next question. In your time with Photon Delta and the Dutch photonics ecosystem, it really doesn't represent close to the entirety of your experience in, in what we might consider high tech, right? So I'm curious, at what point in your career did, did semiconductor tech and, and the importance of microchips and microelectronics, when did that emerge to have the same level of importance and significance to you that it does now? You know, at what point did you comprehend that? I, th I think it was 15 years ago when, when I was managing an, uh, an early stage fund. I set up an early stage fund for high tech startups in the very region of Eindhoven. And I got to know integrated photonics through a couple of investments we did. To be fair, I did not understand a clue about what this was all about, but it, but it definitely appeared to me as, as, as very promising and very convincing and uh, because energy, speed, bandwidth, uh, spectroscopy, I mean, you cannot, you, you can see what cannot be seen yet, you cannot feel what cannot be felt yet, etc, etc. So, so I was I was triggered and, and got more understanding along the way because these companies came back several times for money. Uh, of course, you can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and actually, we were pretty successful. So so I was asked to start Photon Delta in 014 as a small project, uh, and and there the journey started. And yeah, small project, yeah. <laughs> but my but but my main drive, to be fair, was just entrepreneurial: how to make this big and how to become a player in the world. And because that was and still is the potential. It, yeah, well, that, that's, my, that's my drive, to be perfectly honest. I love this technology. It's great. Uh, but I would stop immediately if I thought, if I would think that this would not make it to a very big market. And I would stop immediately if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't be convinced that the Dutch has a claim to win. You know, I, I, I'll take myself back. Um, <laughs> I started here in 2020, and the very first story I covered was ASML's acquisition of Berliner Glass. And I'm thinking to myself, well, ASML, this is an important company. They, they got a lot of resources. They, they do a lot of different things. Very important. Um, fast forward now, of course, and they're, you know, at the, at the four of state meetings yeah. um, with different continents. ASML is ASML. Uh, my question is, you know, 
we've talked about global actors and different dif- different ambitions worldwide and, and how Photon Delta has tentacles, I guess, in, in all those different areas. What keeps you up at night now? I mean, what, what, what takes the bulk of your attention and, and what gives you concern now, given that, um, you know, we are where we are here in 2023? What keeps you awake is how do we avoid, that is something typically Europe, that we do not scatter across Europe all kinds of initiatives to make a photonics industry. To state it in other words, let's invent our own photon delta or let's invent our own ecosystem because we are better. I think it's essential for the world that for this very technology and not just for Europe, but also with, with, U- with the US, that we cooperate uh, and think in terms of complementarities in the supply chains that are needed to bring this technology to a level that it really can serve and, and it can bring the, the next stage in compound semiconductor technologies and, and play a role to, to deal with societal challenges. And you need cooperation for that. And, and that, that sometimes keeps me awake because what you see is that, oh, it's also nice. We're going to reinvent the wheel and we're going to do it ourselves. And then the money that is available and that should be available from, from governments to support this very technology, even a sideway, even TSMC yeah, gets hundreds of millions of subsidy for their innovation. So use that, use those funds efficiently and smart and ensure that we work with the best parties in the world and in Europe and complement each other instead of compete with each other in this, in this stage of, of the technology, because uh, otherwise a lot of money will be used very inefficiently. So that keeps me awake, how to make, to stay closer to home, how to get this European supply chain done, and how can we become complementary uh, in our thinking uh, and sit on our assets and use these assets in a smart way based on a concept to have a European supply chain that can serve the world. So that keeps me awake. Another thing that keeps me awake is the current geopolitical situation uh, with uh, with China. Um, uh, That's no fun. And, and I, think, I don't think it's good for the world, but uh, that's maybe not a topic for another podcast, I guess. Yeah, and just keeping all that in mind, uh, I'll end with this. What are Photon Delta's next stages of growth and in what areas will we see it? We need to scale in Europe. That's our next stage of growth. That's on the, that's on the supply chain part. There's no doubt about that. And that we're going to use the, 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 some proceeds of the, of the, the funding we just uh, have received. Then we get it. We get to. We make a, s- a serious step. But if we want to fully invest, or no, we, we, if we want to become a player in integration and heterogeneous integration, backend integration, because the the next generation of chips is about mix and match, and and you have to have a mix and match factory. If you don't, if you we don't have that, uh, and not cannot manufacture in volume, then uh, we stay what we used to be in Europe, a great place to invent. A great place to develop, but at the end of the day, the real high-volume manufacturing is going elsewhere. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.